Okay, so good morning, everybody, and welcome to the November 10th. DCMGA general meeting and program and we are going to kick it off today with our program and we are delighted to welcome Ann Athey and some of you may know Ann she is an intern from this year's first ever all virtual class of 2021. She's also a retired emergency department and school nurse and she enjoys like all of us spending time in her indoor and her outdoor gardens. I call her a grower and a shower and a knower of all things African violet. And she began growing African violets as a teenager. She loved the pink and purple blossoms. And then one day on a whim, Anne said while she was shopping in a big DYI store, she noticed a clearance table that had a lot of sad violets on them. So she rescued five of them and she was excited to nurse them back to help just like a good nurse and a good gardener would do. And they didn't disappoint her, except they outgrew the home that she had given them on her windowsill. So she was really good at bringing them back to life. So Anne has joined um, subsequently the first African uh, Violet Society of Denton. And she's also a member of many state and other national groups where a lot of experienced growers share their love and knowledge of African violets. And today, Anne's going to share the history of African violets with us, as well as growing tips, easy propagation techniques. And so we're just going to get right to it. And Anne, we are delighted to have you. Welcome. And thank you for sharing your knowledge with us today. Thank you, Catherine, for that introduction. I am just so excited to be here to talk to you all about African violets and what I know and what my experiences have been. Um, at the end, we're going to have a, a Q&A session, but like Catherine said, our to-do list is going to be quickly, I'm going to go over the brief history of um, African violets, a little bit about the classification systems, features, tips of growing, propagating techniques, and um, resources at the very end. So I, well, I wanted to get started uh, by asking you all through a survey, how many of you currently are growing African violets or have grown them in the past? And the second question is, uh, what level experience would you say you are? You're a novice, are you moderately experienced or are you an expert in growing African violets? So, at first, when I was asked to present on African violets, there was a possibility we were going to be um, person to person. And at that point, it would just have been a simple raise of hands. But through the Zoom technology, this, is, uh, this works too. So I'm really looking forward to seeing who we've got here and what experience you have and whatever it is. I hope that I have some tips here that'll help you as you go on your growing journey. Some so, of you may have had. Um, so Anne, I don't know if you can see the poll, but the I first can. you can. Okay, yes. awesome. So once uh, I can launch the second one, once we kind of address this one. So an interesting result there. Yes. Almost 50% of you have grown African violets or are currently growing them. Only 30% haven't grown them in the past. So maybe this will excite you. And as you go to your big box store, you'll find some or in, um, I know Metters sells African violets. Um, so let's get started. Oh, also your experience level. Are you a complete novice, <laughs> somewhat comfortable, but still learning or are you an experienced grower? As I was saying, many of us have had moms or grandmothers or some family member that have grown African violets and they have just grown beautifully and it's with seemingly little care. And I hope that the tips that I can share with you today give you a similar experience. Maybe your first African violet was given to you as a Mother's Day gift or an Easter present um, or maybe like me and hopefully not like me, you pick some off of a clearance rack. So I'm looking at the results of this poll and most of you, well, it's almost 50-50, consider yourselves 
either novices, moderately comfortable, or we have some that are experienced growers. So yay. Super. There's just something about a flowering plant. And in, in the case for me, when I see a plant that's just exquisitely beautiful, like many African violet blossoms are, it's like when a singer hits that perfect note or you see that perfect piece of art, or even when the clouds clear from the sky and you see sunshine, it's just like that aha moment. So let's switch gears and talk a little bit about the history of African violets. Back in 1884, um, Tanzania was a territory of Germany. And there were a couple of gentlemen who were in the area and they collected African violets. And one of them successfully sent plant material back to Germany. And we'll get back to that in a second. But what they found was that there were two main regions of where African violets could be collected. One, this is on the eastern side of Africa in Tanzania. One location is the tropical forest and the other location was at 9,000 feet in the mountainous areas. So either they were dry or they were very wet, but the common condition that was found was that they were all in a shaded area. All of them received about a half an inch of water every third day, but again, what was consistent about them was they were either on a face of a rock or they were in a crack of a rock or the base of a tree, so the water drained pretty um, quickly. They weren't sitting in water. So Captain Walter Baron von St. Paul, he sent plant material back to his dad who was a horticulturist in Germany. And his dad grew the plant and was delighted and sent it on to a friend of his at the botanical garden area in Hanover. This gentleman, Herman Wendall, he wrote the first scientific paper on what he described and gave the name of, to the plant as St. Paulia after the collector and his father. Not long after that, in the early 1900s, a company in Germany um, began selling, commercial selling and raising of African violets and also in um, London. So the, the history began of the African violet in the United States, again, in the 1890s, where a nurseryman in New York City decided that he would grow and sell the violets in his nursery. He bought plants, he bought seeds, but was not successful because he wasn't prepared to, the environment wasn't prepared to keep the temperature at a warmer level, which African violets like. So African violets at that time got a history of being pretty finicky. Um, then a grower, a nurseryman who had several acres in West Los Angeles, Walter Armacost, he and his partner Royston purchased some African violets and African violet seeds. And what they were able to do was come up with 10 stellar plants that are our original hybrids today. And these are just beautiful and delightful plants. From these 10 plants, all the varieties come from them in the United States at this point, except for some of the newer varieties we're seeing. So African violets started to take off in um, the early 1940s. And it was with a article in the Ladies Home Journal in 1945 
that really was a turning point for African violets. And it wasn't until 1946 that there was such national interest in the plant that there became this founded, um, excuse me, this national organization, the African Violet Society of America was founded. And th the very next year, they held their first international conference. So the popularity and hybridizing just grew exponentially over the next several decades. And it started because the home grower um, now had home heating systems where they can consistently maintain and grow African violets in the temperature uh, that they like. Hybridizing just took off and we began to see plants that not just were pink and violet and blue, but we were started seeing many different colors, many different leaf shapes. So um, for those of you who enjoy classification and taxonomy, what I can tell you is that the plant family, well, let me back up. Classification has undergone many changes for the African violet. DNA sequencing has helped landed it in a, a certain section. It's in the plant family Gisneriate. And it's within the genera Streptocarpus. So it's a subgroups of Streptocarpus. Its scientific name, again, is St. Paulia, um, named after its collectors. The Gisneriate family is a very large classification. But what was done early in the early 1946 is the African Violet Society of America was given permission and the right to register all new hybrids and varieties. And they are all registered with the African Violet Society to this day. So let's switch gears and talk a little bit about the characteristics and features of African violets. These are among, um, these are four of the 10 original hybrids. And as you can see, very simple petals, five petals, um, purple, blues, and lilacs. And hybridizing has, as you know, changed all that. We're gonna go through a little bit about the growth habits of African violets. So the characteristics usually uh, used to describe African violets start with the size. And this is where I ran into a little bit of a problem when I really didn't know there was anything other than one size African violet. When I picked the five plants off the clearance rack, I put them on a windowsill and it was six to eight months later, they no longer fit. Well, they were, their leaf span grew to over 12 inches. Um, and that got me thinking and doing a little bit of research. And I'm gonna tell you in a minute what I learned from that. Other characteristics used to describe African violets include blossoms, foliage, and then trailers. So I apologize for this slide, but it was a good visual to show the different sizes of African violets. The guy here in the middle, the standard variety, has a leaf span of greater than six inches and up to 16 inches. So as you can tell, my African violet was really, off. it was a standard and it was very much off the windowsill. Today, I enjoy growing because I can buy more and I can have more in my collection. I like the miniature and the semi-miniature varieties, but Let's take a look at some of the other features here. Foliage is also very beautiful on the African violet. So even though they reward us with almost constant year round blossoms, when they're not blooming, there's these beautiful uh, leaf patterns that we have to look at. And here are some gorgeous variegated leaves. So I have some photographs of plants that I just wanted to go through and show you some of the um, different 
features. Here we have a standard and this guy here is the amethyst and it's one of the 10 original hybrids. And you can see its leaf span is greater than eight inches at this time. This is a red orchid blossom and its foliage is a beautiful heart-shaped dark green quilted and glossy. Here is the standard and this is a large guy. I really never knew that African violets grew quite this large. This grower on the right uh, and his wife reside here in Denton. He, um, before he passed on, he was a hybridizer of African violets um, and he hybridized under the name Lone Star. So he has, I believe five or six Lone Star varieties. This is a semi-miniature and it just fits so perfectly in that teacup. The blossom is, you see its blossom is um, a semi-double flower, red pansy, dark green foliage, um, a treasure of mine. This is a spring peach, semi-double, lovely variegated mosaic foliage. This is also a miniature. So Anne, Ruth's asking in chat for the photo you just showed of the big one. Is that still just one plant? Sometimes it looks like a lot of several smaller ones, but that's just one, right? It is one and it grows from one single crown and it grows from the center and then all the leaves on the outer edge are the older leaves. And look at this guy, how teeny he is. The blossoms get so large that they can even cover up the foliage. The nice thing about the blossoms on an African violet is they can last four, six, eight weeks at a time. And then after they're disbudded, you'll get rewarded again in four to six weeks with more flowers. Another popular style of African violets are trailers. And this is different than the ones we were talking about before that had a single crown. Trailers have multiple crowns and they're delightful. If one were to show a trailer, trailers must have at least three crowns um, in order to be shown. They like to be grown in narrow saucers. They're just lovely. And they also are identified by size. They are standard trailers, semi-miniature trailers, and mini trailers. So some additional features that we can see on the blossoms are, um, for example, this flower on the left is called a fantasy with that lovely painted look, um, chimeras, which has got that pinwheel shape color. This guy here is a thumbprint. You can see it just looks like someone put their finger, their thumb in paint and then just put it on the blossom. What we've seen in the last couple of decades are African violets coming from Russia and the Ukrainian hybridizers and growers and they are just showing some very, very beautiful plants. I love that bell-shaped flower. So let's go on to growing basics. Um, this is a gorgeous African violet on the right. And you can see it just has a perfect rosette, a perfect wagon wheel shape. Violets need good light. They need um, good water, containers, certain potting medium, fertilizers, and an environment much like you and I like. They like their temperatures between about 65 and 75 degrees, 78 degrees, kind of like us. And they need pretty good maintenance. So let's talk about light. Um, not all African violets perform the same under the same lighting condition. In my light stand, I have violets 
that are doing very well. And then one by, might be performing not so well that's sitting right beside it because he like, likes a little less bright light. Um, I have African violets growing on the windowsill. Violets can be grown and enjoy bright, um, indirect light. Although I do have some violets that are getting full sun a couple of hours in the afternoon. My amethyst, he just loves the afternoon sun, which is kind of strange, but he's very, very happy. Plants with darker foliage need more intense light. Variegated plants tend to um, do well with medium light. So here's my plant stand and you can see up in the right hand corner of that first photograph, I have um, a window there and it's a south facing window. So he gets some pretty bright light up there. But then I also have other areas. Here's a windowsill and those guys are doing fine as well. Um, the important thing about light, if you do have your violets near a window is that one has to be careful about the temperature because even though it may be the perfect amount of light, if it's too warm, it's not gonna be a good spot for your violet. Your violet's gonna tell you whether or not they're happy. And we just pay attention to the signs and symptoms and there we go. So one of the symptoms of getting too much light can be tight centers, tight crowns, as you see with the, in the photograph on the left. The guy on the right, I wasn't sure whether to add this guy, but he's kind of a neat um, thing to talk about. This plant is a variegated leaf plant. The leaf that is a variegation is the mother leaf. This baby has, um, is surviving solely on the photosynthesis that's coming from the mother plant or the mother leaf, excuse me. If the mother leaf were taken off of that plant, he would not survive. So here's an example of too little light when the leaf petals are reaching towards the light source. Leaves will also become weak and sometime a coppery brown look to them. Also your bloom stalks when they do occur and one of the signs of not getting too much light is your African violet won't bloom very frequently, but when they do, the bloom stalk will also be reaching. And so Anne, Ruth's asking for confirmation that too much light makes a crowded crown, correct? Yes. There are other things, Ruth, that cause a tighted crown, but that is one of them. Too much light, yes. I mean, so, yes. I'm sorry, too little light. Too much light is when the stalks are reaching towards the light source. All right, let's talk about water and watering methods. So different areas have different quality water. And that's important um, for our African violets. Um, if you are in an area it's always good to know what the pH of your water is. The water that comes out of my tap is 7.8. My rain barrel water is 7.2. African violets tend to like to be grown in a slurry mixture that is a little bit acidic and we'll get into that a little bit more here in a, in a bit. But Oftentimes our fertilizers, if, if we're using rainwater, we're not gonna have the trace elements in the water. So our fertilizers, we need to pick them so they have some of those trace minerals. 
I was asking um, a panel of experts at the last show about how often they watch their pH, how often do they test the pH of their water. And a famous grower hybridizer from Sugarland, Texas said he never checks his water. I was surprised. He said Sugarland has perfect water. And so um, he doesn't need to. He uses the same soil, the same fertilizer, and his tap water is stable. So um, there are different watering methods. Um, watering from the top is a fine way to water. It depends on your collection. That is going to help guide what kind of watering methods you should be doing. There are some pluses and minuses to each of these different methods. So with top watering, one of the things we have to be careful about is um, getting water in the crown of the plant. Now, our leaves can get wet and that's okay. African violet leaves should be washed off upon occasion, but they do need to be dried before they're put back under the light source. If they're not dried, um, as you know, they can have burn spots on them or browning. So top watering is fine. Um, in order to know when to top water, you just tap the soil to make sure that if it's dry or not. African violets like an even water um, of their soil. So another way to achieve that is through bottom watering, watering from the saucer. If we are um, watering our violets from a saucer, we just need to make sure not to leave them sit in the saucer for greater than 30 minutes. Another important thing about watering that I haven't mentioned, I should have said earlier, was that our water should be room temperature or a little bit on the warmer side, but room temperature is what I water my violets at. Another um, interesting, okay, let's see. Another interesting type of watering system is self-watering systems. Um, I'm, I'm on a wick watering slide and this is how I water some of my plants. I use a variety of methods, but as you see, these little condiment cups can be filled and with your wick container, your wicked container, you can put the container into a small amount of water. And again, the pot should not um, be sitting in the water. It should be just slightly above as you see in the photograph and the top right. Another way to wick water is with a mat. And I use this for a lot of my plantlets. The upper left photograph is a picture of um, a crate. And that's a plastic crate that's used for roofing. I found it at a big box store and you just cut it down to the size of your tray. I covered it with felt and then just poured each about every three or four days, I pour my fertilized water into the, um, into the tray. And it's good for watering a number of plants for several days. The third type of wick watering I do, and I don't do this often, but this is a wick tray setup. The tray has the water underneath it. I set the crate on top and the wicks are poked inside the crate and they go all the way to the bottom of the tray. Now, I don't recommend doing this. I had to go out of town for um, almost two weeks and I was having my granddaughter babysit my plants. It was close to showtime. I had never done a show before. So I was worried that if I kept these plants in a single reservoir, 
and she had to pick them up to water every single reservoir that there could have been an accidental fall or breakage of leaves and so forth. So we set up this situation. The good side is it was easier for her to take care of the plants. The, the potential problem lies in if the water gets infested with a disease or with a pest, it could potentially wipe out or at least infect the, your whole collection. So I don't recommend this, but for that situation, I decided to, to risk it. So the next question is whether to use clay or plastic and either are fine. It depends completely on your collection, how many plants you have. Um, the clay is nice because African violets like a light mixture. They like moist, even moisture and the terracotta pots provide for that. The downside is if you have a large collection, that's a lot of terracotta pots. But terracotta pots can also be wick watered. There are some new fangled things now. They're probably not so new, um, but self-watering pots and people have a lot of success with self-watering pots. But again, they, they are an expense. And if you have a large collection, that can be uh, very pricey. So a lot of experienced growers that are growing multiple plants use simple plastic pots. They, they don't let air, air in and out, but they are practical and they can be cleaned after their use. I think one of the, um, well, let's just go on and we'll talk about that in a minute. So the next question about containers are, what size do I use? What do I put my violet in? And the way this is determined is by just a small formula. The pot size should be a third of the diameter of the leaf span. So as you see in the upper picture, that's a six inch diameter plant. The pot size should be two inches in diameter and so forth. I think one of the things that I see mistakes made at with African violets are when people are repotting their violets, they tend to pot up to the next size. That's African violets don't often need that. They like their little fibrous roots kept a little bit on the cramped side. So for minis, for example, they should never be in a pot greater than two and a quarter inches. So we, we can just, um, when it's time to repot them and with minis and semi minis, they need fresh soil about every three to four months. So we can clean that um, plastic container off and just repot the violet back into that same container. What type of soil do we use? Um, it was around the 1960s when soilless mixtures became very popular. Uh, folks stopped using dirt type products because Violets were getting infested with nematodes. And so soilless mi mixtures became popular. And those consist mainly of a fine milled Canadian peat moss, um, perlite, and some vermiculite. Now, this is really very important to the African violet. And mainly, I was given some good advice is to use your starting point as to what the other good growers in your area are doing. So we don't use very much vermiculite in our soil for, for our conditions, except for when, when we're propagating and then we'll add additional vermiculite. Again, um, the goal with the soilless medium is to have a very airy um, mixture. We don't want the violet to be dry. If it dries out very many times, that could be a fatal flaw for that violet. 
if it does uh, end up getting really dry, say we forget about it, it's on the back of the shelf, the wick wasn't acting properly, um, the way to then revive that violet is to water it a very small amount to just get the soil wet and th to go back in a half an hour, an hour later, and to then water it with your fertilized water. Fertilizers are important to African violets, although they receive most of their nutrients, 95% of their nutrients come from photosynthesis. The other 5% comes from fertilizers that we add. And so because we only need to add a small amount, we, we say fertilize weekly, weekly. So I just continuously um, am fertilizing my violets, changing their fertilizer mixture, which is not, not everybody needs to do that. Um, part of my, you know, I'm just uh, following what some of the growers in my club do, and it's been, I've had a great deal of success with it. So probably the biggest tip about fertilizer is more is not better. When we talk about weekly, weekly, we add a, a quarter or an eighth of a teaspoon of fertilizer to a gallon of water, depending on which fertilizer is being used. So probably my first learning experience with my violets was I started out using one fertilizer and I thought that it was a smart thing to just add some Super Thrive. I thought I would just go for it. And so I added a small amount of Super Thrive, had wonderful luck. And about six months into it, I noticed that I had very tight crowns, much like if um, you were getting too much light. So I researched it and thought, oh my gosh, I might have a disease. My my violets might be infested. I looked up different disease possibilities, thought maybe I had um, broad mites. And so I threw out some of my violets. And upon further research, I was over fertilizing my violets. So what I did at that point was I stopped adding the Super Thrive and just used the fertilizer and my violets were fine after that. The environment that our violets like to live in are temperatures of 68 to 75 degrees. They might get by with 80 degrees for a while, but um, just have to pay attention to what they're telling you. They do like humidity of um, 40 to 60%, but along with that high humidity, they need to have good air movement powdery mildew can be a problem for African violets because of the high humidity. So care and maintenance of your African violets, monitor your plants very carefully, good grooming, repotting, and they like to have their roots tickled when, the, um, when they're repotted. I thought that was funny. So grooming, especially of your minis and semi-minis, includes watching for suckers. And uh, this is a good example of a sucker. One of my favorite tools is these long nose sharp tweezers and just have to pull them out. If we don't pull the suckers out, um, what we'll end up with is a misshapen African violet. Here's another example of um, a violet that needs grooming. Do you see those shorter leaves, those under leaves in the bottom row? Those leaves need to come out. They're not catching light and they, they are, um, I'm not gonna say they're impeding airflow, but they're just not important to the growth of this plant. 
so they can be removed. If they're a young leaf, they can be, and they're healthy, they can be used to propagate. Here's an example of where the African violet has grown. It's maybe an older African violet and the outer bottom leaves have been removed and now the crown, crown is showing. Once that crown gets an inch above the soil level, it needs to be, the plant needs to be repotted and perhaps some of the roots removed. One of the most very drastic measures that can happen here is a complete decapitation of the root system. And then what happens is one would replant that crown back into a um, clean, healthy soil after scraping the stem um, and then bagging it and making sure it stays at a moisture, at an even moisture level and put under the grow light and roots will grow from there. So examining plants with intent. I have to really think about that because I look at my violets every day, sometimes 10 times a day. I'm just always looking, but I'm not always looking at them with intent. So what I have um, been encouraged to do and is to look at my plants every now and again with the microscope. The microscope to the upper right was a little $8 micro microscope and it's a 60 times um, lens. It has a little light on it and it's portable. You just, you can walk around with it. You can examine what's going on with the leaf. You can look for critters. You can, it, it's just wonderful. The one on the left is a 1600 um, lens and it hooks up to my computer. And I don't know if you can see it's lighted you can, it's handheld, you can put it down into the crown, you can put it underneath a leaf, and then it shows up on the screen. You can take a photograph of that picture and send that picture to one of your friends that um, is very experienced in the area. I love this feature. I don't always know what I'm looking at, but I, I think it's wonderful because you can capture that image and send it on to, to someone who knows what they're um, looking at. So with African violets, there are some diseases and pests we need to watch out for. I'm not gonna talk in great detail about any of them, but just know that funguses are the most common diseases among African violets. There's bacteria and a virus. And then in terms of pests, thrips are a problem rod or cyclamen mites or soil amelie bugs. Um, so the take home comment about this is we have to really keep a close eye on our collection so that we can get a handle on any problems that might arise right off the bat. Um, and those of us who garden outside or have dogs or open our windows, just know that our pests, pests from outside can fly in. Thrips, mites, soily bugs, aphids, you name it. They all can come in uh, on our clothing, on our hair. So I have made it a practice that before or after I'm working outside in the garden, I won't go to the African violets to do any work on them until I've showered. We have a... Um, a wonderful hybridizer in Carrollton, Ken Musileski. He sells on eBay. He's um, got some wonderful, wonderful varieties. He doesn't let anyone in his house at all because of the fear of bringing an infestation into his collection. I have um, heard from many collectors of losing large amount of violets, having to throw away hundreds of violets because um, they've gotten either a disease or um, a pest. We get to the point too where we have to kind of decide, 
if we have a plant that is infested or has a disease, do we treat that? Do we, because it can take months to determine whether or not the plant has survived the treatment. It may be expensive to go out and buy um, chemicals if our home remedies don't work. So many times you'll hear an expert grower say, just throw it away. If the plant has some meaning to us, is precious to us, we can remove some leaves, sanitize those leaves and put them down and see if we can propagate them, isolating them in another area of than our grow space. So Ann, I'm sorry to interrupt again, but before you move on, Susan's asking, what's the name of that grower again? And does he sell to the public? Can, can they buy from him in Carrollton? Yes, um, the answer is he, grows out of his house, he does not have a shop except his Etsy shop. No, eBay, I'm sorry, his eBay shop. Um, and if you contact me, I'll send you his, his address, his, his name is Ken Musileski. And he, he's quite a Renaissance man. He's a firefighter, he's a hunter, and he's a, a hybridizer of exquisite African violets. He grows not just standards, but semi-minis and minis um, under the name of Hunter's Hybrids. So all of his collections will say something like Hunter Whitetail Fawn or um, Hunter's Last Kiss, or you know he has these crazy fun names for his plants, but. Yes, I, I'm happy to share with you his information. So let's move on to propagating. African violets can be propagated in different ways, blossom stalks, leaves, or plant material. I have experience only with leaf propagating um, and I've had a lot of success with it. I enjoy it, I have the bug and Sometimes I just have to talk myself down from putting another set of leaves down because as, as your African violets grow, they'll have multiple, multiple rows and uh, eventually you take out those rows. So about propagating, what you wanna do if you've got a plant that you just love and you wanna share that plant is you'll take out off the bottom row if it's a young bottom row and it's healthy, you can put those plants down. Now, always use um, sanitized utensils when you're working with your plants. I use a very light medium, um, although this, this particular batch doesn't look so light, but lots of perlite and a fourth vermiculite. The petal should be cut to from about a half an inch to an inch long. Um, at a, the petal should be cut at a 45 degree angle with an X-Acto blade. And I take um, a chopstick and I just put a very small hole in the soil and then put the leaf in it and then just go across. Make sure you label your container, um, the container here you see is probably a produce container that's been sanitized. Uh, I love them and I particularly love and encourage folks to use the ones that are, have the lid attached. But again, be sure to put the date that you've put the leaves down and label it. Um, I try to put just one variety in each container. They don't have to go under a grow light. They can be grown again in indirect bright light and they're fine. So what happens at center photograph is um, about 12 weeks out, 12, 13, 14 weeks out. I do enjoy the community pot method, which is what I'm gonna call this to the left. But every now and again, I will put a leaf down 
in an individualized container. Um, I don't grow very many standards, but I acquired some and those leaves were large. And so what, what you can do with a very large leaf is cut the top of it off and put the petal down into the soil mixture. And, just, and again, I water these from the top. They are not wick watered. Um, so here is an example of a plantlet. The mother leaf has been removed and you might, and normally I would let it grow larger than this, but for the purposes of taking this picture, I wanted to show you, um, this is what the plantlet may come off the mother leaf looking like. This could be one, two, three, or four plants. So my instruments are a makeup brush because once we start repotting them, they can get um, the soilless mixture, the peat moss on them, and we want to wash that off. So the wick um, method comes, starts to play in now. And what I do is we purchase synthetic yarn or a synthetic material. I bought some yarn that was four ply and I separate the plies. And as we're getting ready to pot, we soak the, um, the yarn or whatever it is in water and then pull it up through the hole in the pot. Then we put our soilless mixture in, leaving a little bit of a hole and then just gently put the root down. I put the root down in this plantlet on the light on the right, or excuse me, on the left, and I looked at it, and lo and behold, it was more than one plant that you can see on the right. So I took it back out of the pot and divided it up. Um, and you can use them all, but really, um, just I would suggest just getting used to growing them up and then picking the very finest and putting the very strongest ones, healthiest ones down into the pot. Once, this is not the same plant, as you can tell, this is one, uh, a mother plant with variegated leaves. It's very small. Um, and these are solo cups the, uh, that I poked holes in the bottom. You don't have to go out and buy fancy uh, plastic pots. Solo cups from Walmart um, are fine. But again, you'll have to walk, you'll have to label that. We also put the date once we put the plantlet in the pot, and that's to make sure you know that in three to four months you're going to need to repot that plant. Before that plantlet goes into its light source, it's going to need some type of humidity tent. It could either be baggies or a plastic dome. So considerations when buying your African violets, always buy healthy plants. Don't do what I did. Do not buy off a clearance rack that has African violets that look poorly like I did. Those can have thrips, those can have disease, and you don't want to be taking those home with you. Not sure why, I, I just didn't know at the time. I thought the nurse in me is going to nurse these plants to health. And anyway, uh, but don't do that. So the the African Violet Society of America has many resources to help you choose your plants. Um, members vote on their favorite plants, ones that have the most blossoms, that last the longest, um, that are the easiest to grow, and that list is on their websites. There are many African Violets that have no IDs, um, and even though they are no IDs, they are still wonderful and beautiful plants. Um, the African Violet Society of America also has a software called First Class, and it is a complete database of all 20,000 cultivars um, that gives a photo description and the registrar name, the hybridizer's name and the year it was registered, and it's a wonderful product. Bringing a new African Violet home, before you enter the door, remove all the blossoms. They can harbor thrips. Um, purchase from a trusted vendor. There are many vendors out there uh, and 
just word of mouth is a good thing in the violet community. Always quarantine your violets from any other house plants, not just for a short period of time, but up to three to six months. Um, prophylactic use of insecticide is optional for the first three days. And then lastly, I, I want to mention that um, there's conservation efforts occurring because the 190 African violet species are in trouble. The only locations they're found in the world are in Kenya and Tanzania. Um, and that there's a, an area, a mountainside, there's six mountain regions that are um, at risk because of construction and so forth. And the bee pollinator uh, that, are, that help pollinate African violets are at risk as well. Once these forests are removed, um, it allows the African violet habitat to dry out and die and other plants, competing plants can take over. So I just wanted to leave you with a few resources. The African, um, the American, the African Violet Society of America, oops, <laughs> is a great resource. The Lone Star African Violet Council is a wonderful resource. Many expert growers, we have, experts here in our Denton um, site. We have master senior judges uh, and they're very generous with their knowledge. Book resources, uh, much of my growing knowledge came from my mentors and my coaches in the African violet world, but this book, You Can Grow African Violets by Canton Joy Stork is, um, is the textbook basically. Some Texas AV growers, Glenda's House of Violets, Hunter's Hybrids, and then United States growers um, are very, very uh, reputable. Um, it's also, Facebook is a good thing when it comes to the violet world. My favorite violet site group is the African Violet Nerds, and that is managed by Joyce Stork, the, the author of the textbook. But these others are also very good. Um, resources. I am finished and I just wanted to say that hour went by really fast for me and I hope that it was helpful to you. Thank you. And it was wonderful and just such a wealth of information and inspiration. So thank you for such a, a thoughtful and, and well done presentation. I think we answered a lot of the questions along the way, but does anybody have any other questions? You're welcome to unmute yourselves and ask away or uh, wait, here's one in chat and you're welcome to put your questions in chat. So Karen said, can you please put up that last slide? I guess the one right before this for a moment, the one with your resources. That the one, Facebook Karen, one, is that one you need Karen with the Facebook? Yes, thank you. Awesome. And I'll um, also show while you're at asking, uh, while we're waiting for questions, I don't know if you can see this. Melissa, uh, let me see if I can see myself and see what I'm showing. Melissa Migas just emailed me this and said, this is her African violet that she just oh. purchased in the, how do you pronounce it y'all, Kokodama? Is that how you say it? Oh my, beautiful, beautiful. Yes, it's Kokodama. Or some people call it Kokidama, but I call it Kokidama. Beautiful. And Karen Jamison emailed me privately during the presentation, Anne, and she said maybe we could have some sort of pop-up activity where everybody can bring their ingredients and make their own Kokidama. <laughs> That'd be great. Just that one. would be fun. Any other questions, y'all, for Anne? Lots of wonderful compliments. And in the chat. Thank you. Thank you all. Wonderful. Thank you so much.